Oh, hello, world. Welcome back to Comic Book News. Man, thanks for checking us out. This has uh, been a really fun time for me and my channel. Uh, I really appreciate everybody who's been tuning in ever since um, our first Steve Jeppy live stream. We had a humongous outpouring uh, of people coming in and watching and commenting just from all over the internet. Creators, publishers, fans, everybody in between. It's been like a, an amazing experience for me it's like the positive side of what the internet's all about speaking of positive there's been some controversial stuff on the channel lately um i don't shy away from controversy but some people get tired of it and so um i'm gonna switch it up I, i've got this new series planned i want to talk about what it would take to make a brand new comic book shop right what comic shop 2.0 and what what does that even mean what does my background mean? I've got a bookstore. I got a comic book store and I'm blurring the lines. Where's all the Funko Pops and toys and magic cards and stuff? Well, we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about product mix. We'll talk about point of sale systems. We'll talk about digital subscription management system. We're going to talk about everything you need to think really hard about before you open a new store or before you make changes to your existing store to meet this post COVID crisis world, man, everything is going to change from now on. We don't know why. So how much it's going to change. So like how much can we plan now? Well, it is never too soon to start planning. It's time to start rethinking our assumptions about what a comic book store even is or means. And boy, oh boy, have I got a terrific panel of, of, uh, the best retailers, some of the best retailers, excuse me, in the comics industry. Um, some we've seen before, some are brand new. I want to welcome to the show right now um, uh, some of my guests. But first, I want to do a little slideshow real quick, guys. I want to talk about, um, well, maybe it's time, uh, maybe it's time to put on the tinfoil hat for a second here because we've got a diagram. So um, let's talk about, about what this means exactly, okay? So uh, this is just my kind of crude attempt to, to, to outline like where uh, you get, uh, where comics get to consumers, right? In currently, new comics. This is talking about new comics only, new product, right? Because that's a big part of what drives the current direct market comic store as it's known. And we'll talk about why I think that's a kind of a misnomer. So what we have here is basically so the big players here are the creators and the fans are the biggest piece. That's because without that, there is no industry without that connection. But man, there's so many different ways to get the work of creators into the hands of fans um, that result in different sets of values, right? There's trade-offs in these methods. And I'm not going to go through this whole thing. I'll bring this, I'll go back to this maybe with the group. Um, but in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is that um, it's not a zero sum game. Comics is not a zero sum game. It's that we live in a multi channel world that's not ending and it's going to only accelerate going into the future. So, comics have to be ready for multi channel sourcing of products and also multi channel selling of products, right? If you're not ready to do that, I don't think you're ready to be a 21st retail, 21st century retailer of anything, let alone comic books. All right. Now, um, I want to introduce uh, some of my guests today. Uh, first, law, uh, many time contributor, good pal from Chicago, Illinois, uh, Jim Mortensen, Comics Revolution. Welcome back to the show, Jim. Thanks for having me. All right. Next, I want to bring in um, another face you may recognize, the father of free comic book day, 
long, uh, multiple time panelist on the show, Joe Field. Flying hey, Colors Jim. Club. Hi, Jim. How you? How y'all doing? Doing awesome. Thanks for coming, Joe. Really, always appreciate you being on the show. Um, Good to be here. Next, I want to introduce first timer, um, but longtime fan of this channel, uh, Regan Clem. Uh, has been watching since I think my first video when they were really, really awful, as opposed to just kind of like crummy the way they are now. Regan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Dan. Great. I'm sorry. If, I, I don't have my notes in front of me. I forgot the name of, of your store and, and your location. I don't have it written down. Summit Comics and Games, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Lansing, Michigan, two different stores. Great. I've never visited that store, so I, I apologize. I hope to one day. Yep. Tell you my next trip to Lansing, it's a lock. All right. There you go. <laughs> We're the only comic shop in Lansing now. <laughs> oh, man, even more reason. Of course I'm going. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Last last year, well, I, one more guy I want to bring in for a second. Good pal, Mike Hansen, up here in my area. He's a bookseller and a contributor. He's going to be behind the scenes wrangling the comments and trying to interact with some of the comments so I can focus on the conversation. I'm also going to bring him back in to ask some questions stuff because he's a sharp guy and he thinks about this stuff a lot. Thanks, Mike. Good to see you guys. Yoink. All right. Now, last but not least, I'm really, really proud um, to, to introduce my next guest. Never talked to him before today. And man, I wasn't disappointed in what he told me already backstage. If, if he says half of what he says backstage on the show, it is going to be an awesome show. I want to introduce from Mile High Comics in Denver, none other than Chuck Rosansky. Hey, Chuck. Hi there. Hey, great to meet you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, it's nice to be on the show. Thank you for inviting me. No problem. Um, fellas, it's a brave new world. Um, we got a lot of stuff. Uh that we got to figure out, right? I'm, I'm, I've been for the past couple of years, past 10, 15, 12 years, whatever it is, since I've been out of the retail business for good. And only the past year that I dipped back into the culture of comics at all. And I was a little disturbed at what I saw as the state of kind of the industry as well as the culture. And so, man, I started reaching out to you guys, my pals, and, and the conversations alone that we've had have made me feel better about the industry. The stuff with Steve Jeppe and all of the retailers and publishers gave me some warm fuzzies. But the feedback that I get is that, well, let's get real, right? What's the problems with the industry and where, how do we fix them or can we even fix them? Is there a future for retail at all? Um, I want to go around the horn one time on just your initial thoughts where do you think um, the comic, like if you had to do it today, would you even think about opening a comic store? L let me start with that. I want to start with, uh, I want to start with uh, Morty, evil Morty Mortensen. Jim, what do you got? Uh, would I start a business today? Uh, boy, that's a hard question. I don't know what I would be giving up for the opportunity cost to speak honestly about that. Uh, there certainly are chances. There's everybody on this page has people who make their money selling comics. And uh, there's still a lot of folks who do that week in, week out uh, before COVID-19. Uh, we'll see if that carries on beyond this time. Um, but I think there's a way to make a living, uh, if not a good living, selling new comics. Great. Okay, Joe, what are you thinking, Joe? <laughs> well, What's if next? I were to get into the business now, I, I would be a fool because I'm 64 years old tomorrow. So uh, there... There, there wouldn't be like a super long career as a part of this, right? But uh, I, I think the business is still viable. Um, I, I have said for a long time that I, I believe there's room in North America for probably another thousand shops that are that are well managed and well run and well capitalized. But there may not be a thousand shops right now that are well capitalized. So uh, uh, that could be out, out the window at this point too. So. Um, would I get into it now? Um, I would say probably not. Uh, but um, that's me at 64, not me at 32 when I got in. Okay. Um, Regan, you've got a couple of stores. You got yeah. into this. It's been a while. You're not a rookie at all. You're far from no. it. What's your thoughts? If you were to, if you were just getting started now, uh, what would you do or what, what would you do differently compared to how you planned it the first time? Be better capitalized when I start. 
<laughs> that would be something. I because we started the business with only I was really young. I was eleven. Like my story is an odd one. And my dad loaned me two hundred dollars. I ordered comics from Friendly Franks in Chicago. This was back before the distribution wars. And then Friendly Franks eventually closed. I went with Capital City and they got shut down pretty much and Diamond was my only choice. But I really think if you would look as young as Joe at 64, you should go into the comic business because he looks really young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I am shocked. 64. That's you look you look in young fifties, Joe. Well, thank you, Regan. Uh you yeah. checks in the mail. Hi. Thanks. Thanks. All right. No, but well, I yeah, so be better capitalized. I mean it's not it's not cheap now. Like because we're looking at starting our third store. We were really intently looking before the whole pandemic broke out. Um and we'll have to see. Now we want both stores to be profitable again before we go that way. But. Right. Okay. And so speaking of youngsters, Chuck, what do you got to say on the subject? <laughs> well, uh, first off, I think this is probably the best time that there's been in decades to open a store. Um, but the reason why most stores are undercapitalized is because they piss their money away on new comics that they don't end up selling because their customers screw them. And uh, so I think that if I were to open a store today, which is essentially kind of what I did here at Jason Street, um, I started completely over again with a uh, model where I totally minimize new comics. And uh, if you uh, really want new comics and you want great service, get the fuck out of here. I don't want you. Um, I really don't want to sell new comics. I had a huge fight with my staff over it, actually. And uh, they finally convinced me that I that I just absolutely had to. And uh, I'll let you in on a little secret. Um, since Diamond shut down, we've had the most profitable eight weeks in uh, many years um, because we're no longer sending, well, we're still sending them money, but we're paying off all the back debt that we had. Um, but we we are just cash flow positive like you wouldn't believe because our market is secondary product we are transactionalists where we're buying and selling from consumers rather than from big mega corporations that are out to screw us and uh, by controlling what we purchase coming in over the counter we actually control our own destinies but the reason why I say it's such a great time to open up a comic shop is because um, we're looking at the ruins of an economy, which is kind of like what I looked at in 1974. Uh, I was able to get a shop. It was a bad shop in a bad location, but I only paid 95 bucks a month in rent. Um, that Those kinds of deals, <clears throat> relatively spoken, are going to be coming up now because this economy is in tatters. And you're going to be see untold numbers of small businesses fold. This will be the cheapest time in decades to be able to rent space, to negotiate a really inexpensive lease. And then you have, um, unfortunately, and, and I'm just saying this is purely from the perspective of, of what the environment is. Um, there's going to be 20 million people that are out of work and that are going to have to sell their stuff. And they got to sell it to somebody. And uh, it, it, in this market, having even the slightest amount of cash makes you the king. And, and, and speaking of buying used product, I mean, there's going to be we don't like that stores are going out of business, but they are. And they're going to have inventory and product that they're going to need to liquidate. And and that could be a buying opportunity and a resale opportunity, too, don't you think? Yeah, but you got to be really careful because I think that there's going to be a short term glut where you have desperate retailers that are going to be trying to put things up for sale at whatever they can get. And uh, the there's not going to be any kind of um, intelligence that's going to be behind the, the selling decisions nearly so much as there's going to be desperation. Uh, but I opened in 1974 when there was a huge recession going on and the, uh, the Arab oil embargo had just happened and, and inflation soon thereafter was at 18%. Yeah. Um, and so during moments of economic turmoil, um, that's a moment when entrepreneurs can actually take advantage of situations within their own particular context or environment and get going. When you have an economy that's humming along, there's very little 
room for for small people to get started. Um, but when the economy is cratering and landlords suddenly have empty space, you can wheel and deal. You, you can't wheel and deal in a bustling economy. Chuck, that echoes my thoughts exactly. I mean, on the uh, on the opposite side of every crisis is an opportunity. I, but I want to ask, I want to go back to the other guys. I want to go around. I want to go into a little bit of what Chuck's talking about here. I want to ask you guys how much, if any, um, you rely on uh, back issues. Like what kind of, let's just talk in general terms, like how much percentage of your store is devoted to it and how much of your profit would you say is coming from it? You don't have to give specific numbers. Maybe if you're willing to maybe talk about percentages. I want to know from, uh, I want to know from Joe. Because I'm going to guess. I'm going to make a guess first for each one of you. I think Joe never got out of old comics, has always loved back issues, and continues to carry them at your store. But I want to hear it from him. Joe, what do you, well, what do, you do? Here's the deal. When we opened 32 years ago, close to 40% of our sales were in back issues. And uh, so we were a whole lot more balanced between new stuff and old stuff. Um, and now, uh, back issues, uh, we're a lot larger business, but, um, but back issues for us are a, a smaller percentage of the business. Um, we're now in the 10 to 15% range every month. Um, but we're, that's still shifting a, a fair amount of back issues. And, um, I, I there, there is, uh, there's definitely lots of opportunity there, but, uh, um, it's like any other piece of the business is that, um, uh, there's a lot of junk out there to go along with the, the few diamonds, uh, that are, you know, s stuck in the rough. Um, so it's, um, uh, it's not, it's not a game that I would recommend anybody to get into without having, um, more, a, a deeper knowledge of, uh, of the back issue field. Um, it's not for the faint of heart, but if you know your stuff, like, like the guys here, uh, on the screen, you're going to be okay. Um, and for us, I, it's, I, I, I still love the old stuff and, and that excitement I think comes through when I, when I'm talking with people about it. Um, and, uh, I, I couldn't see being a comic shop without doing the old stuff. And, okay. uh, to, to a degree, the, the way I see back issues right now is the way major publishers see, uh, Amazon or Barnes and Noble. It's, it's another sales channel for them. And, uh, we need to develop different sales channels for us in order to stay viable and to keep on growing. Um, and hopefully we'll grow again once this, uh, this COVID thing is behind us. Yeah. You know, I, when I bought my store, I thought I, I you know, I pursued, um, what I think of as like a Brian Hibbsian model. Like I had read, a lot of tilting windmills and a lot of his stuff. And I thought, you know, I want to cater to readers and I want to collectability is not my thing. And so I don't think that it's right for a store. I feel like that was a mistake on my part. Well, that's uh, so that's a, that's one of those deals where uh, collectability and readership don't necessarily negate one another. Uh, there, yes. uh, there are, there are collectors who were dyed in the wool readers who love the old stuff and want to keep on reading it. Um, yes. And so, yeah, it's uh, there's crossover between uh, collectors and readers. And it's it's not it's not an either or. It's a both. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was a huge epiphany to me, too, as well as the fact that there's a humongous crossover between superhero fans and art comics fans like yeah. people. A lot of people like me just like comics and we don't draw those kind of distinctions. Um, so I want to ask Jim, I want to ask Morty, um, back issues. I'm going to, I want to guess cause you're, you were kind of me like me. You were before me. I'm going to guess you, you didn't have back issues and, and maybe you rethought it. Cause like me at the end, towards the end of my tenure, I realized I made a mistake and I started bringing them back into the store. Is that a similar scenario to you? You know, I, I came into the business roughly when you did, uh, with the same sort of feel to it where, uh, these are things to be read. There are things to be consumed, enjoyed. You get your money, you set it aside, and, and you get to the next thing. Uh, I really was against collectability. Um, you know, and, and to this day, we're still very, very low on back issues. Uh, it is definitely something that we're interested in. Uh, but everything that we set up was systems to make things efficient 
to get as much product uh, in through and back out as possible. And, new, and new product. New product, new product. And, and, and to not have to have a, a specific knowledge base uh, for that particular thing. You know, when, when I got into the business, you'd walk into a comic shop, the middle 80% of the floor would all be back issues. And that middle 80% would, would, would maybe do 20 to 25% of the actual sales, which as a retailer, as somebody who likes statistics and that sort of thing, just bothered me so much. Like, why would you devote so much of your space to something that, that actually gives you so little return as opposed to getting that out the door, getting things back. Uh, I used to make an example that uh, when, when Target can't sell a toaster, they don't mark it up another $5 and call it a collectible toaster. Uh, they, they mark it down, they get it out the door, they get the next thing in. Uh, and, and that's what I set my business up to do. Uh, 24 years later, we're, we're still around, but uh, you know, back issues certainly seem to have seen a huge growth in the area. But you know, for you, for myself, for Joe, uh, I think for anybody who's a retailer, there's a sweet spot of the best comics in the world. And the best comics in the world came out five years before you started your store and for probably three or four years after you started your store. And those are the things that you just love, you identify with, you're always going to vibe with. Uh, uh, and, and that's sort of the golden era. You know, for me, Chris Ware and, and 8Ball and Fanographics and all that stuff, uh, that's sort of the golden era. Uh, and so for me, there isn't a nostalgia uh, or, or a connection to back issues the way that perhaps everybody else here has. I, I, I got into the business a little I'll, bit later. I, 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 I opened my shop at 32 rather than at 11 or 22 or 16 or whatever. You know, it, so many people got into this business at a very young age, but um, when Jim uh, uh, talks about the, the, the golden age is the five years before you open and the three years after, uh, mine was 15 years before I opened and uh, um, going into five years after. Um, yeah. So I, it, it was a much uh, broader um, time span of, of stuff that I felt was, uh, was my stuff. Um, I Reagan, a uh, Regan, I'm sorry. I, you know, I've never, is it, did you go Regan or Reagan? It's Regan. Regan, right. Okay. So Regan, tell me tell me your back issue experience in your store, and then we got a, a question coming from the super chat. Like you, I was heavily influenced by the people that were saying not to do back issues. But we had started before that and we were doing back issues, but we actually then quit. So we had been doing back issues for probably 12 years, but they weren't great revenue for us. And we quit back issues because those were uncool and they were catering, catering to collectors and we wanted to be a bookstore, you know? Um, so we quit doing the back issues and we started about seven years ago again. It's a good revenue stream, about 10% of sales in both of our stores. It's about the similar 10% of sales. Um, it's, it's the thing I enjoy the most though. Like if you tell me today, like my job is to go in and handle the back issues and play with the back issues and price them. Like I, I, I actually just said it was playing. So it's like, it's the funnest job in the world, the back issue part of the business, in my opinion. I don't know why we ever quit it really, besides I wanted to be cool and accepted by the comic retail community. As I've gotten older, I realize making money is more than important than being cool and accepted. So oh. yeah, go figure. Um, what do you think? The one thing <laughs> yeah, yeah, go figure. So, but the best comics ever thing, like I, rem I your conversation just the other day with Dan Fraga in the 1989 thing, and I was thinking, 1989 also had a lot of junk. Like, that's in our dollar bins, or not even that. We don't even put them out because it's not even worth putting out. And so, like, we remember the good ones. And, like, you can come into the store right now, and I can give you 10 great books that are new from the last few months. And so there's still great books being made. And so right. we, it's not just 1989. Every era has great books. And so You're right. I and, and I would even go so far as to say that, you know, the, the comics are like anything else. There's a state of the art, right? And everything that came mm -hmm. before informed what's coming now. And we're getting some of the best comics ever, as well as a bunch yeah. of stuff that's not as great. So like it's always going to be a mixed bag. Um, mm -hmm. I want to bring up I want to bring up here from the super chat. Somebody paid 10 bucks to ask this question, guys. So let's pay attention. Yay. Is there, is there a point where there are so few comic shops that distribution becomes no longer financially viable 
And do retailers have a plan if Diamond closes up? So they've said uh, there's what, about 2,000 comic shops. And some people have said there's a tipping point of maybe 1,000, that if it goes below that, it's not financially viable. I don't want to hear from Chuck because we haven't heard from him uh, in, a, in a bit. Chuck, what do you think about this? Well, I think we're already past the tipping point. And that's where I, I keep referring to this, the kind of the dialogues that we're having about how to better sell new comics as, as you know, like trying to chart a new path for the Titanic. Really, um, the, what we have right now is an industry where absent an infusion of external capitalization, an enormous number of comic shops are, are teetering on the edge right now. And maybe I'll end up being completely wrong. Maybe some of them will pull back. But um, going to something that was that was mentioned a little bit earlier about 20% um, of the revenues coming from back issues that take up 80% of the store. Um, you know, we have that here at Mile High Comics. Back issues only constitute about 30% of our business um, and trades constitute 30% and then toys constitute about 30%. Um, but there's an underlying basic reality. And that is that the products that we have here are ones that we own, ones that we don't have to order from the supply channel. And something that I have been, always been paranoid about, and I'll, I'll give you just a second of background, and that is that my mom lived through the bombings in World War II and the absolute destruction of the German economy in 1945. And she taught me in bedtime stories when I was a little kid, five years old, that you never, ever rely on institutions that you think are going to be around forever because they're not necessarily going to be. And so what we have right now is a comic book industry that has relied upon diamond that has relied upon the fact of, hey, let's focus on turnover, let's focus on maximization of revenue streams within the context of getting stuff every week. That's just so lazy. It is, it is being a diamond catalog outlet store where you're like a fuller brush salesman, where you're just waiting for your new shipment of brushes to show up. And then you're hoping that the people that promise to pay you actually will and won't walk up to the counter and say, oh, you know, this one really sucks. I think I'll just put it back. Um, and it is just a fool's paradise. When you put that 80% of your floor space into 20% of your revenue stream. What that is, is insurance. It gives you something that you have control over. And that's what's been lacking in this business. And that's why it's cratering right now. The question about whether or not the comics industry is going to continue is predicated on how much working capital do retailers have and are AT&T and Disney going to actually want to rev up their product lines enough to provide revenue streams that are large enough for stores that have been so goddamn lazy? I am going to repeat this for emphasis. Okay, when all you do is you get a catalog in, you hand it to your customers, and then your big skill is compiling the numbers and turning in the order. Give me a break. Okay, that's not really retailing. Um, that's just being an agent. And uh, everybody that's been an agent for Diamond is biting it right now hard. And so are they going to have the working capital to start over again? I don't think so. I think we've already lost the critical mass of this business. And so looking at the solutions, you can't be looking at the past. People have to start thinking about what the comic shop of the future is going to be all about. And anybody who is idiotic enough to put themselves back into the same scenario of ordering from new product suppliers and not concentrating on collectibles where you control what you buy, what you own. I mean, if you look behind me right now in this picture, 
There's half a million comics in this one row. I have 20 of these rows. I own them all. I don't give a shit whether there's another new comic published ever again because I'm going to be just fine. Can anybody else say that? I don't think so because you mm. all were ordering out of that damn previews catalog. And look where that got you. The minute previews shut down, all of a sudden you had no money coming in anymore. That's Chuck. my story. Wow. I man, I just wish I could get you to give a a, a, an, a real opinion, man. I wish we could really know what you think. Um, but uh, yeah, well, Joe, you know, I don't I'm I'm too old to care. <laughs> you know, I just I don't care. I'm tired of the stupidity. I've been doing this 50 years and I've had people tell me I when when I did the Comic-Con movie, Morgan Spurlock after we were done shooting and everything, he confided in me that I was the dinosaur. I was the guy that was still selling paper and they wanted to have one representative example of the past of of that which was obsolete and dead for in their in their movie. And um, you know, I kind of took that as a challenge. It's like, bitch, I think I can outlast you. And uh, uh, guess what? I'm still here. That's my favorite phrase these days, by the way. Okay. Uh, you may be fucking smarter than I am, but guess what? I'm still here. Is, is there a, a chance for follow-up for Chuck? It is, you know, what you do with your size, the inventory, the quantity, the years, uh, you know, is that something that you feel is replicable to 20 or 50 comic shops in every state across the nation? Or is there space for five mile high comics across the nation and everybody else gets to fight over the scraps? I mean, is it something that you can take from a, I don't know, whatever is 15,000 square foot uh, uh, warehouse and replicate with a 900 square foot space? Uh, somewhere else, or is that something that's just so unique that only a couple people can do it, uh, and they can do it really successfully, but it's not something that necessarily uh, is replicable? Oh, I'm so glad you asked me that question, because I actually have the answer. Fair question. And the answer is, is that the 900 square foot comic shop is dead. Okay, I was one of the first people in the nation to open up a mall store. I opened up a mall store in 1981. And, uh, you know, Buddy had some at that point down in Texas. And uh, I think that they may have had some at New England Comics. But for the most part, mall stores were a new invention back in those days. And we were trying to drive a lot of traffic. We were selling 50 cent, 75 cent comic books in those days. And uh, the idea of trying to reach as many consumers as possible was, was important. And so yield per square foot foot was important. You really focused on your turnover. You focused on your new products. But that's dead. That, that whole model is dead. You can no longer pay even strip mall rents. Um, that's why we're seeing people like Lee's Comics going out. I mean, we're seeing comic stores collapsing around the nation because the rents that they're paying, the cost per square foot is too high. Now, the real model going forward, and this, this is the golden opportunity. It's sitting right in front of everybody's faces and they're refusing to acknowledge it. And that is that over the last 30 years, the major corporations have sold an unbelievable amount of licensed crap. Every person on the planet has Pokemon or Walking Dead or they, they, they have Funko figures or God knows what, but everybody in their house has crap. And everybody moves, everybody gets divorced, everybody gets new interest or a girlfriend who says, you got to get rid of your crap. And there's no place to recycle this stuff. And it's a great business. We buy on busy days upwards of 12 to 15 collections a day. We don't know what they're going to be. It could be anything. I mean, they're just anything that walks in the door, we're willing to buy it because we have and this is the key to everything, cheap space. Our store is next to the railroad tracks on a dead end street in the middle of fricking nowhere. And I'm taking in millions of dollars because okay, people I who want this stuff will find us. Okay. All right. Joe Field's been trying to get in, been super patient. Joe, you have a question? Then I want to, I don't want to go to Reagan. Regan. Well, I you know, uh, the, the the question, Chuck is right. It, it, if you have cheap space that allows you to do things that you can't do in expensive retail locations where, where I am, um, I, I, uh, I would 
I, I, Chuck probably owns his own pro uh, property there, his warehouse, and um, and that's something that is a very difficult nut to crack in larger markets. Uh, I know that if I were to just try to buy the 1,700 square foot store that I have right now, it would be a $2 million space at least. And, um, and, and, and there aren't a lot of people who can come into the game and do that sort of thing. So do you go to a warehouse situation and reduce your cost tremendously? Well, I, I got a warehouse. I've got, I've got both ends to try to deal with whatever contingencies there are. Um, but, uh, when my business is not about being a diamond catalog showroom, which I absolutely abhor, um, 80% of our sales come from walk-in. They're, 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 uh, they're, they're not pre-orders. Uh, more than 80% of our sales are from people who come in and browse. The comic store of the future, it, well, we don't know what it's going to look like because we don't know what kinds of things are going to happen as a result of this uh, uh, pandemic and what changes that might bring on in terms of how people can shop and how many people can be allowed in a store at once, all of that. So it, uh, anybody walking into a store like mine that is 80% browsing sales and we can only allow in 50% or 25% of the traffic we could before, that, that's definitely death for, for uh, um, upscale retail comic shops. Joe, I have a question. I want to push, push back it's, uh, lightly. Uh, of your 85% that are off-the-shelf yeah. sales, how many of those would you say are just your regular comic book customers that are just trained to come in on Wednesdays? But they, essentially, they are regular. They're not brand new, net new customers to your store. Do oh, you sure. have a way to track that and do you think about that? Well, I, I yes, I do think about that. And uh, we, we do, with our point of sale, we are able to track who's buying what and, and how much they're buying and all that. But I, um, uh, it's it's the add-on part of it that's the the critical thing. Is that if people came in just to buy specifically what they wanted that they had in mind from the from the diamond catalog that they might have seen, even though they didn't place a pre-order, um, if we just did that business, uh, we'd be substantially uh, um, selling less than we are right now. Okay, Reagan. Part, 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 Reagan? part of it part of it is the experience of shopping. That is, that's a critical piece of what we do. We provide community, we provide a shopping experience, and we provide something that they can't get from either buying cheaper online or uh, uh, buying digitally or, or any of those kinds of things. The, the community aspect is the aspect that I'm really concerned about going forward. Th thank you for bringing that up, Joe, because this is a critical point I was trying to bring up in my diagram before. So good segue to bring it back for a second. That this graph here or this chart, the thickness of these lines is sort of like the profit margin coming back to the creators, right? And and the or, or the profit margin, I guess, as it thins out, as it goes through the various middlemen. And what I wanted to point out is that while the creator might get the least per unit going through a retailer and distribution that the value, where is the value, right? The value in my mind is just what you said, that it is a place. It is a physical sp space where people are coming with money in their hands and want to purchase comics and putting your comic in a place like that has a lot of value to spreading your brand name and selling more comics and ultimately to making you more money because that is the bottom line. Um, so I want to, I, I, what I want to say is this, it's this that's being overlooked often in the market and that is not a zero sum game that cr crowdfunding can and should coexist with direct sales to consumers and retailers and uh, electronic and digital. It's an ecosystem. It's a food web of comics, if you will. And I want to get some comment. I want to get some thoughts just on that general point. I want to start with, with Regan, who's been super patient. The, I think there might be, I like your chart. I think brick and mortar stores might be two different types though. Um, Cause I think Chuck is expressing one type of store. And again, I still have a mall store 
And in the mall store, I'm looking at my numbers right now, 94% of the sales are not pre-ordered items. So 94% of what I sell is stuff I stock, they come in and buy. Now, I see Dennis in the comments saying, how's that worked out for us the last two months? Really poorly. That's worked out really poorly. This is not a good model to go in if the pandemic is perpetual, but I doubt it will be. And I don't think I need to come up with solutions to make money during the pandemic because we weren't like scraping by. We weren't operating week to week or month to month. A store that was doing that is going to be in big trouble right now, but we're able to weather the storm. We're looking forward to, Indiana is back open retail wise. We're only allowed to have 25% in. But um, yeah, so the idea though, that, so there's two different, I think, brick and mortar style stores. And I don't know if one's right or wrong, but if new comics did quit coming, I would be out of business. I mean, I am a new comic store. Right. And I like that. I mean, so I, I wouldn't want to not be that. I love giving somebody new books that they love and being part of the culture and the community. And, and so that's, yeah, that's why I'm in this business. That's what I enjoy. So, okay. I I'm going to listen to the comment here from Dennis. This is one thing I will listen to Dennis Barger about. I want to get back to Chuck for a second. Hi, Dennis. Chuck, I want to say, I want to ask you this point blank. Okay. When you, I, this is what a lot of people say to me. They go, hey, man, Chuck Rosansky got lucky and he found the Mile High collection and that gave him enough of a nut to do whatever he wanted in the industry and divorce him. And he can now, that's easy for him to say that he's going to divorce himself from new comics because you're a multimillionaire in your giant warehouse full of million dollars of comics. This is not me saying, this is the collective world saying this. So what do you say to the new young guy who's like, man, I love comics. I love business. I want to make money. I want to sell comics for a living. What, are the, what does that guy do today first to open a comic book store? What, what, what assumptions are you saying? Are you saying he should not even put new comics in his business, his or her business plans? The, what I would say, huh, well, there's multiple things that you just asked there. A um, couple of them. Uh, the first one is, is that, yes, I've had a couple of big transactions in my life. One of them was the church collection in 77. But the much bigger one was actually the um, when I did the Mile High 2 collection in New York, where I got two million um, bronze and silver age comics, most of them near mint. Um, that deal actually made me $20 million. So um, if you want to uh, attribute uh, uh, value, but the problem is, is that uh, this business is so treacherous, especially new comics, um, that new comics are the quicksand. They are where you will lose all your money um, because you are ordering um, for incredibly fickle fanboys who may or may not actually pay you. And uh, you're taking all the risk on and when And when you were taking the risk on and comics were 50 cents um, and you were paying 22, 24 cents for them, then if you ate them and you sold them as a back issue for a buck, then OK, that's not a big deal. But when you're buying them for, you know, two dollars and uh, then you're eating hundreds of them um, because tastes change, then that becomes where that's the hole in the bucket. That's the expression I use all the time. That's where you're losing your money. And uh, so the, the comics that I have behind me here um, were never paid for out of um, the big early collections that I got. Um, I've actually probably purchased, and I'm, I'm just guessing here, um, 30 or 40,000 collections over time. And the trick is um, you, you buy a collection, um, you sell a third of it to cover your uh, operating costs, you sell a third of it to cover what you paid for it, and then a third you put away and then repeat over and over again. And eventually you'll have a whole lot of crap. Um, believe oh. me, I am a whore. Okay. I have Hello. a whole lot of crap. That, 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 that's but, but, but let but me ask you this. This is, this is replicable. It is replicable yeah. by anybody because all you have to do is start buying and make sure that you do that third, third, third equation. You just, okay. you got to cover your operating costs. You can't be stupid and overpay. You got to pay fairly though. So you got to, you got to find that sweet spot where you can generate enough in the way of earnings. Um, but there's one final thing, and this is, this is really weird. And it's hard for most people to get their heads around is that it has to not be about money. Um, because I'm always broke. I never have the monies. 
Um, I'm, I'm, you know, if I get a hundred bucks from the front register at the end of the evening, I'm thrilled um, because I, my taste, the way I live is really inexpensive. My goal is just simply to buy more product every day and to add on to what we're doing because I'm building long-term capitalization and value that insulates me from exactly the kinds of disasters as what we're looking at right now in the industry. Okay, fair enough. However, I will point out that as an internet, primarily, I'm, I'm assuming most of your back issue sales are on the internet and that, you know, you draw and, and purchases. Maybe I'm wrong. No, no, we sell a lot of them through the store. And there's something that, you know, they're one of the, 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 People always try to think that they're being incredibly witty when they say, oh, my God, you have such mile high prices. Um, and it's like, yeah, right. I've never heard that one before. But there's a point there. And that is that I price higher than other people in a lot of instances because I see things before other people do. Because unlike the Overstreet or other price guides, we actually have quantifiable data. When we see a book blowing out the door, we raise the price. And then people start screaming at us and they say, why are you raising? the price on this book when you know such and such price guide says you know it's only x and uh, the answer is if you want to buy one of those go to the person who published that price guide and see if they can get you one good luck with that all right and so but what i'm saying is is that we haven't exactly tried to be um incredibly competitive in the marketplace. So we do some sales online, but we do multi-channel sales. We do some sales through Amazon, some sales through eBay, some sales through our website. We have some new comic subscriptions where by God, we have a credit card on hand before we order any shit for them. Um, okay. and, and so we diversify. Well, that's what I wanted to point out to you very quickly because I want to get back to these smarter guys, but uh, than me rather, is that, you know, new comics, the things that you mentioned about new comics being potentially dangerous, a lot of that has to do with not having systems where you can pre-authorize credit cards, pre-charge and ship and make sure that you're not going to as well as having fast enough inventory control systems to respond to the FOC to make sure that you are targeting and getting your orders right. My contention is that if you do those two things correctly, comic, new comics can be extremely profitable and are coming in every single week as opposed to a roll of the dice of waiting for somebody to come in with a sellable collection, which is harder in small localities than it might be for you. I'm just, I just want to bring that up. I'm not, I'm not objecting to your point. I'm just want to point that out. Um, and I have one, and now I have another super chat, guys. I'm sorry, I'm, if people throw money that, that trumps my questions for a second. So, and, and this guy, Mark C, has asked this question before. All right. And so, but it's fair. All right. There was no, the, the newsstand market is gone. That used to be the feeder system. We've heard this before, but it's worth talking about for a second. My contention now is we've got a new feeder system. It's called elementary school and book fairs and bookstores and libraries. Um, and, and I'm going to go to Chuck last on this because I love that look of scrutiny on your face there or whatever that was. But let me go. I know Joe believe, believes what I'm saying is true. Joe, your thoughts on feeder markets and what the next 10, 20 years of comics readership might look like. Okay. My, my best-selling graphic novels every year are generally not Marvel or DC or even Image to, to, for that matter. They're generally scholastic graphic novels or ones from um, – uh, Random House or or Macmillan uh, through the first second imprint. Um, if I look at what I'm selling with Raina Telgemeier, with Dav Pilkey, with uh, Gene Yang, um, uh, Kaz Kibuishi, uh, those things are are selling way better than uh, Spider Man or Batman or Superman or Spawn or whatever. Uh, and those people are finding us through schools, through libraries, and um, and I, I, that was a question I put to one of the reps from one of those companies at the Comics Pro meeting is, how is it that you're doing these thousands of book fairs every year, and yet these books are still among my best sellers? Isn't everyone already covered with this stuff? And the, the response I got back was that even with Scholastic doing some, thousand, some number of thousands of book fairs in schools, 
they were still only cracking less than 10% of the elementary school market with those book fairs, uh, which leaves this tremendous market for their stuff in shops like ours. And, and because we're well located, we're in a suburban area with a, with a lot of uh, young kids and, and parents wanting their, to get their kids invested in reading, we're selling this stuff hand over fist and loving it because it's it's creating new comics readers. Okay, Jim, where are you getting your new re where are you getting the new uh, readership from? Is it from manga? Is it from where? There's a lot of different sources these days from the movies, from libraries. Kids, tell tell me how it works in your store. Well, I mean, uh, just to go back to what Joe said, I mean, Scholastic yeah. obviously is the the huge huge thing. Uh, you know, the behemoth that that moves product. Uh, everybody would like to be that. DC Comics would love to be that. Everybody would love to be that. The interesting thing for me is there really isn't a product that takes them from the scholastic age to either the independent comics or superhero comics or manga comics. They're sort of the tween, early teen age uh, where the, you, know, you look at bookstores, they do amazing with the young adults. There's really not a robust uh, uh, segment that will take us from there to here. Uh, and I don't know if that just means that we need to have more people graduated to that and publishers will respond. I don't know if there's something inherent that makes folks disappear for 10 years before they come back for more mature stuff. But, you know, the, the reality for this, as well as for what Chuck is talking about, is that front list drives back list. OK, so for us, the front list might be a, a, a new Marvel movie, might be a new Marvel TV show, might be a Scholastic, might be the new Spider-Man. But whatever it is, the people are getting their taste and they're coming in and searching out more things because of that first taste, okay? If there aren't new comics to be sold, the interest in Thanos, if there was never Avengers movie, there wouldn't be any. I mean, it was a very small character. Few of us love the character, but in general, it wasn't worth what it is worth today. It's worth what is today because we have movies that introduce people to that, that make it a hot collectible. So we, to a certain degree, I think, are, are a victim of the success of our own industry. If you want what we sell, uh, escapist, uh, heroic fiction, whatever you want to call it, there are so many places to get that today. There's TV, there's movies, there's internet, there's YouTube. You can get it everywhere for very, very cheap, or you can get it from us. But the reality is, is Chuck sells old comics because new comics exist and because new uh, uh, intellectual properties, movies, whatnot, are being made from those things that drive those sales. If new comics didn't exist, if Marvel Comics made crap movies, if no one cared, Chuck would go out of business. The number of people who today have read their first comic or go to see a movie and enjoy it and go, you know what? I really need to get Action Comics number 48. I'm gonna spend $750 to get a random number. For it. Nobody does that. It's, it's a small group of folks who enjoyed it back then or people who are collectors, people who are looking to invest in things. Uh, and it's just not a sustainable model. You move forward 40 years without new comics and it's the same as the Pulse. I mean, Pulse okay. is huge. Sure, we know who Conan is. Sure, we know who H.P. Lovecraft is. Uh, you know, there are a few remnants that exist, largely because they've been perpetuated in other media, uh, whether that's actually a novel for H.P. Lovecraft compared to the Pulps, or if it's a movie for Conan, for Robert Howard. Uh, if, we resign, if we only sold old Pulps, they would be dead. Okay, so a lot of the sort of front list is trying to get new people to see it, new people to experience it. You know, when a back issue goes up in price, it isn't necessarily because everybody sat around and thought, you know, actually, that was a really great issue. I should pay four times as much. No. It, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, oh, there's, a rumor, there's a rumor that that character is going to appear in the next Marvel movie. So holy shit, I got to go get it. Okay, That's so your cool. point is taken that, you, or I think your point here with regard to my question was that we have a feeder system just like we don't even need as much as we may be needed because there's such penetration of mind share that, and people can go anywhere to get a lot of what stores have to offer. It, okay, it, Regan, Regan, I'm sorry, Regan, tell me about that. How do you get new people, kid, new anybody, new readers into comics, especially kids? That's the question well, we're kind of... 
dancing yeah. around. As a shop, I think it's important. Um, Joe's touched on the idea of community a little bit. And I think part of who we are as stores, we are almost the new stand. And, it, and like at least Joe's stores and my stores, like we pay decent rent for good locations. And when somebody thinks of a comic book, they hopefully in our communities will think of our stores because we have been involved in doing outreach in the community. We keep our name out there. We try to be the pop culture source for news, all that stuff. So in a way we do build new readers. And I think some publishers realize that say like boom or the upcoming bad idea. Like they really do understand that we are an asset to their business while other publishers these days, I'm not going to badmouth anyone specifically, but other publishers seem to not want us. And they don't see the value we give their brand. They don't see the value we give their properties. But we, we're on the front lines. We're selling their stuff. We're passionate about their stuff. We're trying to get new readers all the time, um, any marketing way we can. Um, a lot of it's guerrilla marketing where it's kind of not paid for, but it's us like giving books to teachers or it's us giving books to kids on free comic book day, which somebody genius came up with. Um, but the idea is that we do, we're doing outreach all the time. Like I think the problem okay. we have right now, and maybe the model isn't viable for a lot of people, but it is viable for some of us. I don't know why we can make it work and others can't, but more stores are needed. I really think okay. that's the key. Okay. Well, and that's what this series is all about, right guys? That's what we're ultimately, that is our mission here is to, we're not trying to tear apart anything or, or or anybody. When Chuck challenges the assumptions about new comics, man, I go, that is what we want to hear from somebody who's got real experience. And so that's why now let's go to Chuck um, to, to tell us about how do we get, okay, you guys, if somebody's coming to Chuck for old comics, they're probably like comics. They're into comics. Maybe they're old dudes or gals or whatever who used to love comics and got into them on the newsstand or wherever. How's it working today? For you how do we get new kids well <laughs> that's the funny part is that i have new kids i have thousands of them thousands of them because what i've done is i've changed my store from being primarily focused on retailing to being a more of a, a situation where parents and kids can come here and be entertained and we have the benefit of having a huge amount of space when I was millions of dollars in debt, I got an opportunity to buy an immense building on a leverage deal, and I had the guts to do the deal when, when it was available. And so I ended up with a 65,000 square foot building. And what I've essentially done is turned it into an amusement park um, by buying lots and lots of large figures and setting it up in a labyrinthian fashion, which is exactly the opposite of what you're supposed to do, by the way. Um, you're supposed to make, you know, nice, easy aisles and easy access. Screw that. Um, we have corners and nooks and crannies and places where we have displays that I don't even know exist. But parents come in with their kids because it's a way to spend time in a, in a really huge environment where nobody's leaning over their shoulders. And if the parent is into Superman and the kid is into turtles, um, they, they can all find something that they like within this environment. Um, but, you know, there's something that, that, that's kind of gotten lost in this. And we have a certain hubris, a certain arrogance that goes with opening a shop and owning a store. We have this uh, kind of presumption that we are the be all and the end all of comics retailing when in point of fact huge numbers of comics are transacting every day without us even knowing about it if you spend any time at all looking at ebay or looking at craigslist or looking in a local flea market or looking at your um your consignment shops there have been two billion comics published over the last 30 years. They didn't just disappear. They are transacting constantly. But we sit in our ivory tower comic book shops and pretend that this, this secondary market, this entire web of transactionalism doesn't exist. And those people are laughing at us because many of them, by operating out of their garage or their spare bedroom, are making more money 
than the stores that are the diamond catalog outlet stores that feel like they are the ones who are leading the industry. When in point of fact, they're the patsies. They're the ones that are taking all the risk by pre-ordering product, non-returnable, and then hoping that the people that have committed to buy it from them are going to actually sell it. Meanwhile, all these people in the secondary market are making bank because okay. they're buying it 10 cents on the dollar. Okay, I want to point out, I just wanted to bring the graph back in again. I don't, I don't need the tinfoil hat again, but I want to point out, this is what I'm trying to point out here with this, these blue sales channels, online channels here. These don't just come from the retailers. These are where the customers are, right? The customers are buying comics digitally. They're buying them used on eBay. They're buying them from Chuck. They're buying them in stores. They're buying them in bookstores. So my point is your customers are online. Uh, the comic book store of the future needs to have the ability to sell into those online channels for sure. Um, I'm going to remove the graph for a second and I'm going to bring in my, my, my good pal here, Mike, uh, Mike Hansen. Um, let me, how do I do this back to this? Um, and I'm going to slip out for a second. You know what? I'm going to go look at the comments where I can focus on the comments. I'm going to let Mike kind of drive here for a second. He's got a couple of questions to ask to the team. Mike is a very experienced retailer of books and comics, as well as a professional in the industry, uh, editing, and I believe writing as well. So uh, Mike Hansen, please take it away for a moment. And uh, guys, I'll be behind the scenes pulling some strings. Thanks, Dan. Uh, good to see you guys. Uh, real quick, uh, just to clarify, I, I'm not a professional comics writer at the moment. I do freelance for Marvel as a books researcher. So all of the Star Wars epic collections I put together, a lot of the other uh, graphic novels of older material I put together. So I'm very familiar with the older stuff, a little bit less with the brand new comics. Uh, as a retailer, about 95% of what I did when I worked at an independent bookstore here in town was old product. Now, there were a lot of back issues, like what Chuck's talking about, and uh, mostly, most of my sales were actually used graphic novels, and I had to price them similarly to how they were transacting online, partly because I'm competing with not just other brick and mortar, but also with, like Dan said, the entire global ecosystem of every place anyone could choose to buy that product. So I wanted to uh, ask you guys, what do you feel, what works for you as a mix of uh, product as far as new and used, not just comic books, but also uh, uh, used graphic novels and uh, any other tangentially related uh, collectible product, new or used? So, uh, Jim, I wanted to start with you, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, sure. I, you know, we, we do uh, new product in almost every case. Uh, most of what we have for back issue or back stock is unsold stock. That's on a clearance level. Uh, you know, for us, where we're at, you know, the rent uh, is probably not quite as high as Joe's, but uh, it, it's pretty good. Uh, and, and we have to turn things over on a regular basis. I mean, as an example, for a, a $20 Watchmen comic, graphic novel, say, you know, I can buy it for $9 new, sell it for $19.99. For that to make sense for me as a used product, I would have to buy that for three dollars to sell it for ten. Mm -hmm. um, folks coming in aren't looking to get three dollars on a twenty dollar book, and it's really difficult for us to necessarily source uh, efficiently source what we're looking for. If we're willing to buy thousands and warehouse things, that's different. But if we're actually looking to sort of maintain our audience to cater to the audience to do those things is it's a very difficult thing and I, I think there's a little bit of a problem too here we don't want to talk too much about pricing being a, a bunch of different retailers uh there's some laws against that sort of thing um but <laughs> for us, for us it, it it just doesn't uh doesn't work out for what we do for our our foot uh footprint uh, how big we are and how much we pay in rent so even though either way it's non-returnable, whether you're buying it uh, a new one for $9 or a used one for $3, uh, the, uh, obviously the major issue there is you cannot predict what someone might bring into the store to want to trade into you. And obviously you want to have a, a good profit margin on that. Uh, Joe, what do you think about that? Do you deal with uh, used collectibles at all? We do uh, deal with some used graphic novels, but mostly that that's clearance kind of stuff. 
Um, we, we, we haven't gone into graphic novels as a collectibles market uh, with, uh, you know, upscale pricing and that sort of thing. But, uh, but we've done pretty well with the used uh, uh, graphic novels as a, as a piece of our business. Um, my whole deal has always been go with what you know. I'm not a toy guy. I, 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 I couldn't tell you who the different Transformers are. I, I, I'm, I was too old for, for that when I first got into the business. So I, I leave that to, my, uh, to the guys on staff here. I, um, uh, I go with what I know and, and what I know best in terms of uh, collectibles market is old back issues, is the uh, Silver Age and Golden Age and, and, and some Bronze Age stuff. So um, I, I, um, um, I, the, the graphic novel, the used graphic novel thing is, is a piece of what we do, but it's not a big piece. Okay. Um, re real quick as a follow up then, um, since you have a staff, uh, do they ever recommend stuff that you have zero familiarity with? That, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I, I'll, I'll give you, I mean, new examples would be, uh, uh, Kodansha has a, uh, a manga called Witch Hat um, at, at Adelaide. I, uh, at, uh, I don't know, even know how you pronounce that last word in there. But uh, but when that was brought in uh, and shown to me by one of the staff and said, hey, here's an easy pitch on it. We've, we've sold a ton of that book now. Um, and that's been repeated with like Drifting Dragons and, and a uh, um, uh, and some of the some of the European stuff, um, and uh, uh, every every member on staff has uh, has a specialty, and what we try to do is uh, cater the stock uh, our stock levels to that specialty, so that there's always something there that they're going to be excited about selling. Nice. Uh, Regan, do you have hey, any guys, I want to oh. take a second. Sorry, I'm going to do another one of these interrupt to talk to the comments things. <laughs> and this is in a good way. Like, guys, I like criticism in the comments. We don't mind them at all. We love it. We welcome that here. I want to hear what everybody has to say for sure. The only thing I'm going to say is if there's personal insults like this guy's a so-and-so or whatever, please leave them out of the comments. I would appreciate that. I'm going to... Uh, win you for five minutes if I see anything like that, and then I'll boot you if I see it again. But I, we do want to hear from you. Let's just keep it civil, man. Who, who loves a loose cannon? <laughs> We're all the same gang, right? We all want to grow the market. We all want to make money making comics and sharing the love, right? Uh, Regan, you said earlier that you are mainly new comics. Do you deal with uh, older stuff as well? Again, only in clearance, really. I mean, I'll buy every graphic novel that comes into the shop from a customer trying to sell their collection if they take the price that I'm willing to pay. Um, and then we we don't keep them out, but we do $7.99 graphic novels like twice a year. Like we'll do it for one month. We promote it. Like the $7.99 section is back and then we make it disappear and then we bring it out again at twice a year. Um, and then that's how we also clear out our stuff. I mean, we also use the ever other revenue channel like this using selling online our clearance stuff if we haven't sold it in the store. So mm -hmm. yeah, we do that. But okay. no, what you sound like you had going on though was much better. I mean, like a deliberate use section that we're not there. Well, I'll, I'll tell you guys what I had to do because when I got hired at this bookstore five years ago, uh, I actually left them right before the pandemic hit. I mean, amazing timing, but, uh, I had to grow the comic section of this bookstore from scratch. It was a new and used bookstore that had every imaginable category, like a miniature Powell's. It was two stories, but it's in Eureka, California, in a very isolated rural community, essentially. So I had to uh, price for the local market and also uh, try to anticipate what people here would like. And the only way I could do that was by talking and listening to the customers and to carry stuff that based on their feedback, I thought they would want to buy. So um, it, it was kind of a real balancing act. The uh, back issue comics uh, had very limited space. The used graphic novels had incredible turn because I bought cheap and I sold cheap but uh, at a really good profit margin. So I was able to have really, really good turnover in a relatively small footprint of the store. It ended up being the uh, biggest growing section of the store uh, five years straight. 
Uh, but because there was no other expertise to speak of, like Joe was saying about how there's uh, other people on staff that have completely different familiarities, different expertise, uh, it was always a challenge for me to uh, be able to not do all of the work for that one section. And that's really the tough part of being a comics retailer is having so much needed specialized knowledge. Now, uh, Chuck, I wanted to ask you what you thought too. And I wanted to tell you, we've met a couple of times before and uh, I'll, I'll remind you after uh, we are done being live, but uh, I just wanted to say that I owe you uh, a debt of gratitude for two reasons. One, because your business model was very similar to what I had to do on an incredibly smaller scale, but also because I met my wife in one of your shops, the uh, Garden Grove store. Uh, <laughs> we got married back in 2007, uh, uh, a little bit after that shop uh, closed down. And I was there uh, helping you uh, uh, with all this, uh, all my friends on staff uh, load up your moving truck. <laughs> Guys, you're you're not going to find a wife. Uh, oh, in a, yeah, I mean, all the class for the faces behind. Sorry, what's that, Chuck? Sorry, Chuck. What was that, Chuck? Oh, I said we left all the glass for the showcases behind when we loaded the truck. I couldn't believe that, and then that dick landlord wouldn't let me take it after after they they closed it. It, it was that with that moving out of there was a joke. And there's a there's a funny thing that goes with that because five years later, I had a guy come by San Diego Comic Con, and he said, "Chuck, I went by a Garden Grove store the other day, and you weren't there anymore." And I said, dude, we closed five years ago. Just how much did you love our store? Tell me that again. Okay, if you want to once every five years, I'm gonna starve to fucking death. Okay, so forget it. That's why the store isn't there, is because of idiots like you. All right, so, and this is this is why they don't let me work the front counter. Um, no, guys, I, 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 want, me saying, I need to break uh, in here for a second, guys. I need to break in. Um, so, so I want to say, well, first of all, Mike is like, if it weren't for Mike Hansen, literally, like, I don't know what I would do for comic books in this entire county that I live in, right? He's a good example of what, like, one person with product knowledge can bring to a local business or area. Uh, it really, I mean, I don't want to overstate it or understate it, though, because there's not much, I'm, we're in a small rural area, and it is really difficult to run a business. And part of my thinking about is exactly in line with what Chuck is saying about rental space, about, about, and also about, oh, Chuck, well, we might've lost Chuck, but I just want to say like Chuck, what he's saying about one, about getting cheap space and two, about the opportunities that are going to be out there as a result of this situation. There are going to be deals to be had on products, on spaces. There's going to be leases to be made. Where if you've done your, uh, uh, if you've run your stuff right and put managed to sock away some nest egg and don't have to spend it all during this downtime, there will be opportunities. Um, man, I wish Chuck was still here. Uh, but maybe he'll maybe he'll be able to join, uh, come back. But um, I guys, I want to thank everybody here. I know we didn't all get time. It's tough with this many people, and we can only go for so long. I know Joe. It's Wednesday. I know you're working in the store. I know you guys all have comics to sell. So I want to go around with last thoughts and, and we always like to do predictions. Oh, we got Chuck back. Great. Okay. So um, we're going to go around the horn one last time and I'm going to save Chuck for last. Cause man, I've loved every single thing that you said. Not that I don't love this other, this other stuff, but man, you're a breath of fresh air and you're willing to criticize accepted norms. I, I feel like those all have to be looked at carefully. The things that we think, and take for granted about what a comic shop is and should be need to be examined. I treasure you for bringing that stuff on the show. Um, I want to go back around the show. Let's start with, let's start with Mike, Mike, and then I'll pop you back for any last minute comments. If you, if, if you can see any, um, Sounds good. Mike, give me, give me a prediction. Um, oh hey, yeah. Give me a prediction and I'll wrap up at the end. Okay. Well, first I want to say uh, this has been a fantastic conversation and thanks for letting me be a part of it. I have an entire uh, page of notes. So I think we definitely didn't do a, a follow-up on uh, comic shop 2.0. I think that there are a lot of opportunities like uh, these guys have said, and a lot of challenges involving uh, running a comic shop in this day and age. But as far as a prediction, I think that the people that are going to make it, the people who are going to survive beyond 2020 
are the ones who are going to be the most open-minded about any kind of uh, business opportunity. And just, you know, as passionate as we are about comics, anything that is in any way related to what our customers want is what we need to have available for them because that there is no substitute. You know, you, you talk about online sales, you talk about uh, uh, it, uh, crowdfunding sales. That's great if you are selling something to directly to someone who knows what they want, but there is no substitute for getting people to spend money that they weren't planning on spending than having them come into your shop and physically putting a recommendation in your hand because you've earned their trust because they, they know that uh, whatever you give them is going to be good. So like just as a random example here, Adventure Comics 425, this came out before I was born. It, had, it is an amazing comic, and I think that if I put this in someone's hand, the right person's hand who likes this kind of stuff, I'd have no problem selling this for more than I could sell to some random person walking in the door. You know? okay, okay. So your so, prediction, prediction. So my is, prediction, my prediction is you have a have a diverse selection and have a diverse way of selling. So have new stuff, old stuff, collectible stuff, tangential stuff, and sell it to the people walking in your store, but don't be afraid to sell online too. I can't tell you how many used graphic novels I had sitting on the shelf for two, three years that suddenly went out of print, shot up in price online, and I was able to make triple, quadruple, even more on what I thought I could make off of it initially. Yeah, so you never know. Killer. We're going to discuss that on another show because I wrote software that automatically scans the internet for increasing and decreasing prices on graphic novels and did that, and it saved my ass in 2008. So that was more a little more of a prescription Ooh. than a prediction, but all right, whatever. <laughs> Jim, Jim Mortensen, give us a prediction, man. Uh, well, you know, I mean, first off, to, to, to wrap things up, though, uh, you know, there, there's no one size that fits all. I mean, there's small shops, there are big shops, there are back issue shops, there are frontless shops. Uh, I don't think there's only one that's going to survive. There'll be a few different survives. I, I personally think the thing that's going to kill us, uh, say, 12 years out, will be the uh, the liberals on the left, the tree huggers, who will point out the uh, the horrible carbon footprint uh, that comics have. I mean, the, the, the paper milling, the ink, the transportation costs from China to San Diego or L.A. to a, a warehouse in you know, uh, Memphis up to Chicago, the cost in carbon and, and the cost in uh, resources is really, really high. And when you look at a digital format, uh, there's none of that. I mean, there's, there's you buy one thing, you can use it for a dozen things. I really think that the thing that will do us in the, the paper products that will be killed will be from the left, not from the right. Wow, what a prediction. Elephant in the room. Jim, you're wrong, but hey, we'll see you next time. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Stick around. We'll do a, we'll, if we got time. We'll do some backstage stuff. Uh, let's go. I want to go to Joe, uh, and then and, and then we'll finish off with our new guests. Joe, predict something, please. Oh, predictions. Uh, the predictions are. I, I'm still going to be here for a while, so get used to that. Yes. But but uh, the deal is that with when it comes to comic shops, and there are two thousand plus in in North America. There are two thousand plus different ways of doing a comic shop, uh, and and that sort of uh, grand uh, uh, differences in the way this business is run is both a strength and a weakness. Um, I think uh, uh, what I'd love to see is some things uh, uh, retailers coming together in certain ways to uh, kind of solidify our core. Uh, to give us a little bit more, uh, I don't know, lobbying strength going forward. But um, uh, I, I do think that uh, the comic shop will live. Uh, while uh, while it's my turn, I want to stand up and show you the T-shirt. Our comeback wow. will be bigger than our setback. Um, follow uh, uh, back the comeback. That's the hashtag to use. Go out and uh, share Steve Jeppy's new video and... Um, uh, keep on supporting your local comic shop so that we can keep on having these things later on and, and we'll all still be in business. We'd love that to happen. Thank you. Joe, I didn't get my shirt yet and I was hoping to be the first guy to show it on this show. Thanks yeah. for stealing my thunder. All right, I owe you one anyway. Talk to you soon, Joe. R Regan, predictions, uh, either about your store, the industry, or whatever. I... 
I would go with, and I think this is true for Chuck's model and my model, is those who develop community and people feel like loved when they come to your store, good customer service, but genuine, like it's community. It's We, we appreciate them. We love them. I don't care which model we use, um, whether it's Chuck's model of back issues or my model of new books, that store will survive. The one where people just feel they're part of the community and, and we, we appreciate them. We sincerely love them. Our staff loves them. I, I hope. I mean, that's what, that, maybe it's a little idealistic, but I think we have all these different models. And like, I ordered books from Chuck when I was a kid. I, I appreciate Mile High and, and the model that he does. And I probably have learned from him, his articles that he's written recently on back issues and breaking away from Diamond a little. I mean, that's all useful. But I think at the core is having a customer base. And you get that customer base by being a place where they feel loved, I think. Maybe. Maybe it's Man. weird. Can you guys tell that 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 Regan does some preaching uh, on the side? He does, man. He's, and he's a good one. You're one of the good ones, Regan. You've been a supporter of this show literally from video one. I, I appreciate it. Love you, buddy. Talk to you soon. All right, Chuck, bring us home, buddy. Give us a prediction. Hey, go as long as you want, man, because every single thing you said has been entertaining. the The comments love you. I want to give you a second to just predict. Well, my first and foremost prediction kind of mirrors what everyone else has been saying, which is that comics will continue to exist and they'll continue to transact. Um, we already have two billion of them out there. So even if new comics themselves are diminished, uh, there's still going to be people reading comics. There's still going to be people interested in comics. And our job is to get the comics that they want into their hands. And at the same time, to do it in a way where we can afford to stay in business ourselves. Um, I don't think that this is ever going to be a business that's going to make people rich. And I don't think that's why we got in the business. The number one reason why people sell comics is because of the freedom where we can make our own decisions, set our own prices, do what we want to do, and then hopefully build that community that was just referenced. And we have a community here at the store of parents and kids in particular who absolutely adore this place. And, and what we're selling is not comic books. We're selling memories. We're selling memories of parents bonding with their kids in a really pleasant environment where they're happy. And as long as we can figure out ways to make people happy, then they will come back and they will support us and they will help us. Um, I, uh, you know, I obviously have huge trepidations about whether the periodical new comics that we've lived with for the last 50 years are going to be continuing. I see $4 cover prices as being too high, and yet with the diminishment of comic shops, that's almost inevitable as a consequence of this, this enormous shutdown that we've had, this economic malaise, not to mention the fact that there's going to be huge unemployment and a recession going for the next year. Um, I think the critical mass that we've had is probably greatly at risk, but that's really only a periodicals problem. Um, we're still going to be seeing graphic novels coming out. We're still going to be seeing things coming from other channels. Scholastic has become an immense player. And obviously that's something getting into the youth market, the, the young adult graphic novels, that's a market that actually a lot of comic shops have missed out on. And even we have not done as good a job as we should. Nonetheless, uh, for anyone to dismiss this industry and say that it's not going to exist, that's foolish. But it's not going to exist in the way that it was eight weeks ago. That model is dead. And so we need to really seriously think about how are we going to go forward. And, and my answer is cheap space, cheap space, cheap space, and the people will find you. Paying a landlord, making a landlord rich is a fool's game. And the greatest single decision that I made, and I will let you in on a secret, okay? I own $10 million worth of real estate. Accept that for a second. $10 million worth of real estate, okay? I was dead broke when I bought my, my properties, okay? But I was able, when I sold my third property, to totally pay off my entire operating loan that I had for Mile High Comics, all the debt that I had accumulated for years and years. And the reason why I was able to do that was because I became my own landlord. I've made more money being the landlord of Mile High Comics than I ever made selling comic books. And so what Joe was talking about, about being in a, in a major market, 
and having super expensive operating costs. I get it. I used to pay those operating costs. I used to make really jerk landlords lots and lots of money. I had eight stores, a warehouse, and I was just forking out money endlessly to people who were cretins. And the yeah. day that I stopped doing that was the day that I actually solidified my ability to be in this business for as long as I can breathe. So I've been in for 50 years right now, and I tell people it's just a good start. I can't wait to see what the next 30 years are going to bring. Chuck, man, that is great because while you're realistic and you're and you're not mincing words and you're speaking the truth in your mind, you, you know what's up. This is a thing. Comics is a thing. Comics aren't going away. Comic stores well, aren't going away. Graphic storytelling. And the comics that were produced in the past – were absolutely unbelievably good. And many of them being produced today are unbelievably good. But when we're the trustees, the guardians of the legacy of people like Jack Kirby and Will Eisner and Carl Barks, we have a sacred trust right here. Screw money. It's not about money. Anybody fool. I was trained as a financial weasel okay i could go and 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 make money on wall street i could have done that when i was 22 years old and instead i chose to make this my career because i believed in the people that i worshiped for all intents and purposes who were the greatest comics creators that ever lived and i was blessed to have them as my friends and today they're gone and the last breakfast that i had with will eisner here in Denver, I, I sat with him for three hours, and the vow that I made to him was that I would safeguard the legacy of graphic storytelling until my last breath. Chuck, I, man, what you're saying here speaks to the whole – this is the unspoken truth, I think, a lot. Anybody, anybody who's worked in comics retail know that if you don't have that passion, there's no way it's going to work anyway, and that this – this thing, this comics retail thing is built on the kind of passion that you're showing right there and demonstrating that it's, it's the, the work and that we believe in the artistic abilities of this medium. And, and, and I thank you for recognizing that and bringing that up here. Um, Cause it's not just dollars and cents. There's a lot of ways a smart dude like you can make money. I, man, I recognize an opportunity cost in my own life. That sure, I could have made a living selling comics in a retail store in San and build a family and everything else. And, and I had to make that decision because I had a certain other set of skills that, that made sense to do that. But for whatever reason, I'm getting pulled in. I want to go back. I want to sell comics. I want to be around comics. I want to talk to comics people. And I thank you for coming here and talking to us. Chuck, you got anything well, else that you want? Other. Any other pieces I mean, of advice? Yeah, no, that's it. I mean, just always be fair. Give more than what's expected. And always, always, always treat kids like they're the future because they are. Thank you, Chuck. Stick around, please. We're going to talk around backstage if you've if you got a minute. Um, I'm going to wrap right. this up and get out of here. Oops. Um, guys. You know, you heard from a, a wide variety of retailers and you don't have to take my word for it. All of these guys are well known and well respected in the industries. Now, what does that mean? That means behind the scenes, these are the people that work hard thinking about and talking about comics. And that's why I invite them on the show. And that's why anybody out there who's got something to say about the future of comics, I need to hear from you. Right. So, man, if you're a comic book software creator, like I fancied myself at one time, or you're a publisher that's got new ideas on, on, on how to re-energize comic book stores, man. Or if you're just a person who's got some good ideas, come on, send them out to me. You know how to reach out to me, go on Twitter at hijinks or come here and put something in the comments or get on Facebook and reach out. Um, I, 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 I treasure these guys in all their time. So I'm not going to talk too much right now, except to say that um, those people out there who want to say, uh, comic book stores are dead. It's going away. Uh, I, I want to respectfully say you're missing the boat and that none of you probably would even be into comics if it wasn't for a killer comic book store that you had an experience with that sold you on the medium of comics and that locked into your brain so hard that comics just won't let go. 
So thank you everybody who's because those are the people that watch this show, right? They, I don't care what kind of comics you're making or what your political philosophies are. I honestly don't. I want to know, I want you to make great comics and make this industry better and not factionalize and say, we're only going to sell here because the internet's the future or, or man, we don't like crowdfunding because comic stores are the future. Guys, we're not enemies. We're on the same team. We're making comics and selling comics. Keep it as an industry and let's come together. All right. Thanks, everybody. I love you all. If you haven't already, consider subscribing to this channel. Consider hitting like on this video. Consider spreading a link and spreading the love about comics. We're going to be back soon with a, 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 the continuing series of Comic Shop 2.0. This is my new uh, uh, hobby horse, if you will, or my road to hoe or whatever you want to call it. We're going to keep it going. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you extremely soon.